Attempted suicide, grief, and uncertainty. A Wuhan caregiver working at a local quarantine center shares what he saw. Wuhan residents line up outside funeral homes to get the ashes of loved ones who perished from the virus. But are the ashes those of family members? Spain now has the second most people infected with the CCP virus in Europe. Today, we take a look into Spain's relationship with China. Why did the Czech Republic act decisively in the early stage of the CCP virus outbreak? What lessons did the Czech people learn from being under communist rule? In the U.S., the death toll has surpassed 3,600. This as several American companies look to produce tens of thousands of ventilators by June. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A Chinese netizen says family members in Wuhan can't get the ashes of loved ones who died from the CCP virus. He says the ashes of many dead people are mixed together and divided into many portions. Each family just gets a random portion. We asked citizens in Wuhan if they think this is true. One citizen told us he believes it is. This possibility is 100 percent, more than 99 percent. They couldn't keep up with the number of bodies. They often dragged several into one car. Do you think they will burn your family member alone? Supervision? How could the family get in? In Wuhan during the epidemic, it wasn't possible. A netizen wrote, it's common practice in many Chinese funeral homes. You have to pay more to have your loved ones cremated alone. One funeral home in Shanghai has been doing this for 20 years. The CCP has always encouraged people to monitor and report on others if they are doing anything the party doesn't want them to do. Even family members are encouraged to report on each other. Even now, anyone going to a funeral home to collect ashes needs to be accompanied by someone else from their workplace or the community. Many online are furious about it. A Chinese netizen lost his father on February 1st, but still hasn't been able to pick up the ashes. In Weibo, he revealed the reason. Without being accompanied by someone from my workplace or community, I cannot pick up the ashes. I'm sorry. I hate this kind of forced companionship. This is my family affair. It is my right to pick it up by myself. I will not accept any forced companionship. Another netizen hinted at what the Chinese authorities are afraid of. What are you authorities afraid of? What are you afraid of? What are you afraid will be found out? You control everyone using all kinds of means, including police monitoring, because you are afraid that the victims' families will come together and pursue you as the murderer. The ones who caused this disaster are murderers. Murderers. We previously reported on a Chinese college student who risked his own life to urge the Chinese Communist Party to step down. He has since disappeared and no one can reach him. In the video, Mr. Zhang called for Chinese leader Xi Jinping to step down and for the Chinese Communist Party to step down. His video went viral, garnering over 88,000 views in just 18 hours. He told us his reasons for speaking out and risking his own life by using his real name. He said, this epidemic is like a fuse, giving me the drive to say that the Communist Party is wrong. He adds what's most unacceptable to him is the party brainwashing citizens through the education of lies and the firewall censorship. Chinese officials have been saying Wuhan, where the virus first appeared, has maintained zero cases. However, local officials are still reporting cases which aren't documented in the official stats. According to China's Health Commission, beginning March 24th, Hubei province had zero confirmed cases. But on March 28th, a notice posted in Wuhan City confirmed two people had the virus. And on the same day, a family of four at a paper mill in Wuhan were towed away, and the building was closed up again. A colleague said those four were not reported in the official stats. A residential block in Wuhan is on lockdown again since Monday because a citizen with a red color code managed to leave his or her home and nobody knows their whereabouts. People in China are given a color code based on their health status. The holders of green codes are allowed to move around unrestricted. A yellow or red code holder has had contact with an infected person, visited a virus hotspot, or reported having symptoms. A yellow code holder are asked to stay home for one week. Red means a two-week quarantine at home. In a city close to Wuhan, a person is seen lying at the entrance of what some say is the county government building. 
，家里死了一个，家里死的是男主人，现在现场死的是家族。People in the video can be heard calling out that there's a person lying dead at the entrance, that the person's family member had just died, and that no one from the government is coming to take care of it. A Chinese scholar visiting the U.S. sent an email to his colleague apologizing for the Chinese regime. He wrote in an email, "The recent coronavirus from China has evolved from an epidemic into a pandemic, inconveniencing you greatly and even endangering people's lives." As a Chinese, I am very sorry. Chinese internet trolls were quick to respond, accusing him of humiliating the Chinese. North Korea is claiming no infections from the CCP virus, but according to South Korean media, a family of five in North Korea were showing symptoms earlier this month. Authorities forced them to quarantine at home and even nailed the door shut. All five family members have since died as they couldn't get treatment. According to sources in North Korea, authorities require those with symptoms to self-isolate and then nail their doors shut. This way, even if there are deaths, it would still be considered zero cases. And a massive forest fire in southeastern region in China has killed 19 people. That's according to a state media report today. The fire started on a farm yesterday afternoon and quickly spread. 18 firefighters and a local guide died. The fire spread over nearly 2,500 acres of land. Flames and heavy smoke could be seen in the sky, threatening a nearby town. Grief and uncertainty. A Wuhan caregiver tells us what he saw at a local quarantine center. NTD's Juliet Song reports. Mr. Wang is a caregiver at a Wuhan quarantine center. His job is to deliver meals to virus patients who have been discharged from the hospital. Among the patients he cared for, one man left a very deep impression. He's an old man in his 70s. He seems to be in good spirits when I deliver meals to him. He's always very polite, saying I've worked hard. He always greets me with a smile. One day, a doctor asked Wang to send sleeping pills to the old man and said he has to watch the man take the pill in front of him. Wang later asked why. The doctor said the old man's wife died from the virus. The man can't sleep well, cries every day, and is in very low spirits. Why does the doctor want him to take sleeping pills in front of us? He's afraid that the man will keep the pills and later commit suicide. Wang said he's seen quite a few patients in grief after family members passed away from infection with the CCP virus. He knows a patient who wanted to jump off a building. Someone in his family passed away. After that, he wouldn't eat anything. It looks like he has depression. We were able to stop him in the end. Wang said some patients test positive again for the virus after they were discharged from the hospital. Currently, we have about six patients who tested positive again for the virus. They're living on the 11th floor of the building. Wuhan authorities require patients discharged from the hospital to be placed under quarantine for 14 days. There are over 300 quarantine centers in Wuhan. Wang said the youngest patient who tested positive again is in their teens. These patients are placed on a separate floor if they don't have a fever. Workers wear extra gear when delivering meals to them. Wang has been there once. I had fear and worries. I'm being honest. I was a bit nervous about going there. The protective gear is hot and the hours are long. I'm very tired every day. I'm mentally and physically exhausted. My clothes are soaked in sweat four or five times a day. It's really hard work. Wang took the job for the money. He hasn't been paid all the money he was promised, but he plans to carry on as the competition is fierce. Xiao Huagu and Juliet Song, NTD News, New York. Spain now has the second highest number of CCP virus infections in Europe, trailing closely behind Italy. Today, we take a look into Spain's relationship with China, where the pandemic first began. A jump in Spain's virus death toll over the weekend. The country's health emergency chief is the latest official to test positive. 
I am here appearing because, as you may have been warned, Fernando Simon has been tested positive for the coronavirus. The country now has over 94,000 infected and over 8,100 deaths. The prime minister's wife also tested positive. As countries struggle to combat the pandemic, some have started to examine the role that the Chinese regime played in its global spread. Likewise, some are warning against keeping too close a relationship to the communist regime. The global map of the Wuhan coronavirus disease matches very well with the global map of the One Belt, One Road initiative. The One Belt, One Road initiative is the Chinese regime's signature foreign policy project. The initiative finances infrastructure projects in other countries, allowing the regime to accumulate global political control. Spain is not yet part of the initiative, but its government showed interest early on. In 2017, the Spanish Prime Minister attended the first Belt and Road International Forum in Beijing. At that time, not many European leaders attended, yet the Spanish Prime Minister was one of them. Spain's soft approach with China dates back decades. After the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989, it was the first EU country to send a foreign minister to visit Beijing. Later, it called for the EU to lift a ban on selling weapons to China. In return, one of the regime's leaders called Spain China's best friend in Europe. Spanish telecommunications giant Telefonica also has a long partnership with China's Huawei. Huawei is the lead soldier for the Chinese Communist Party's plan to dominate the global 5G market. Once your country's main networks use Huawei technology and equipment, it's possible the whole country's communication network could be monitored by the Chinese regime and Huawei. Telefonica relied heavily on Huawei for its 4G networks. While building its 5G networks, it reduced its Huawei purchases after warnings from the U.S. But the company didn't completely exclude the Chinese tech giant. While Spain focuses on trade and investment from China, the Chinese regime's leaders seem more interested in Spain's political support. In 2019, the Chinese embassy in Madrid pressured a top local theater into canceling a Chinese cultural performance, Shen Yun. The show features scenes of human rights abuse in China. When contacted later by an undercover investigator from the U.S., the Chinese ambassador boasted that he personally pressured the theater. I personally talked to the general manager and I told him, you can't just think of the profit from this show. You need to look at the political side too. There's tremendous potential for you in the Chinese market. You shouldn't lose the Chinese market because of this one issue. And the theater immediately realized the problem. Tian said he has a hope for after the CCP virus crisis is over. The countries with close links to the Chinese regime will realize that although the relationship may present economic benefit, it could also pose security risk and erode their values. Now we go east to the Czech Republic, where things are relatively under control compared with other European countries. The post-communist country was among the first to seal off its borders to China during the early stages of the pandemic. The country is now teaming up with Taiwan for disease control. These are the boxes carrying much-needed medical supplies on its way to the Czech Republic. To cope with the CCP virus, the Eastern European country spent nearly $2 million to buy test kits from China. But days later, a local expert says 80% of the tests are faulty. The Chinese embassy denied the claim. Czechia is now turning to others for help. Last week, Czech health officials connected with their counterparts in Taiwan through video chat. They met to discuss preventative measures. Despite its proximity to China, Taiwan has reported only about 300 cases and five deaths. The self-ruling island learned its lesson about the Chinese regime's cover-up through the 2003 SARS pandemic. This time, the area put its guard up as early as January. This is not the first time Czech teaming up with Taiwan. Earlier this month, the mayor of Prague thanked Taiwan on Twitter for sharing virus safety tips through a letter to his city. The mayor also tweeted on Tuesday that Taiwan will send ventilators to the Czech Republic. He pointed out that they are gifts. In contrast, China sells equipments and supplies to the country, which are neither gifts nor humanitarian aid. Earlier this year, Prague broke its sister city deal with Beijing. Instead, the city signed it with Taiwan's capital of Taipei. 
openly challenging Czech's pro-Beijing president, the mayor has been hitting at Beijing's nerves since he took power over a year ago. He restored the custom of flying the Tibetan flag from Prague's city hall. He also traveled to Taiwan to meet with President Tsai Ing-wen and condemned the Chinese regime's forced organ harvesting against prisoners of conscience. I have to say that as a studied physician, uh, it is completely unacceptable for me uh, this uh, forced organ harvestment. This is uh, completely unacceptable topic and uh, the response of the international community should be very strong to this. The amateur politician's defiance sits well with Czech's growing sentiment against communist China. According to a Pew Research Center report, Less than 27 percent of Czechs view the Chinese regime favorably. That's the second lowest rate in Europe. Experts say that's because China's infiltration reminds many Czechs of how their former communist ruler, the Soviet Union, operated in the country. The Czech Republic got rid of its communist regime in 1989 through the Velvet Revolution. This time, when the virus came, the post-communist country acted quickly and was the first non-nation country to close its borders to China. Today, Czech has about 3,000 cases and 25 deaths, reporting a much less dire situation than its German neighbor. The government's early response was met with wide approval. One poll showed 91 percent support. Its citizens are now ramping up production of their own masks in hopes that measures can be relaxed in mid-April. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Two recent articles published by German media shed light on the Chinese regime's efforts to expand power in Europe. Let's get more on this from our Germany correspondent, Christian Watchin. A recent article in German newspaper Die Welt points out a great irony. After the Chinese Communist Party's cover-up helped create a pandemic, it is now portraying itself as the savior of Europe. The article describes how the CCP propagandized recent exports of medical goods to Italy, calling them humanitarian aid. In fact, the vast majority of the deliveries were paid for by the Italian government. The CCP wants to get rid of its image as a corona villain, and it uses the current crisis in Europe to expand its power on the continent. Here, in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, it's usually crowded with tourists. With millions now feeling the impact of the CCP virus pandemic, some German media outlets are asking, how could Germany and Europe keep falling for the deception of the CCP? A commentary by the deputy editor-in-chief of Germany's biggest newspaper, Bild, points out that the CCP silenced whistleblowers and changed numbers to cover up the outbreak. The article argues Germany should reassess its relationship with the regime. On their way to becoming a superpower, the CCP's lies about the virus were not the regime's last scam on the world. It's up to us how we deal with their lies. The article criticizes German companies like Volkswagen and the German government for being willing to be deceived out of comfort and in pursuit of profit. Reporting by Christian Watchin, NTD News, Berlin. And if you'd like to find out more about the Chinese regime's power struggle, we will be premiering Claws of the Red Dragon this Sunday at 9 p.m. here on this channel. The 54-minute dramatization by former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon delves into Chinese telecom giant Huawei's close ties to the Chinese regime and its goal of controlling 5G. Listen, this is exactly what the Canadian people and the American people need to see, which is a drama, not a documentary. It opens up and explains in a dramatic form exactly what's going on with China's encroachment into the technology area throughout the world. Right now, the path that Huawei's taken as a front for the PLA is to basically take over the networks and the components throughout the world. If we allow this to happen, even for a couple more years, Huawei is going to control basically the communication systems of the West, is a methodology a high-tech methodology to basically have domination over the world. And this is what this film is the beginning of the exposure of that. It's going to cause a lot of controversy. It's going to cause a lot of conversation. That's what we want. We want people to start questioning uh, this. Another major stimulus package might be on the way. President Trump is calling on Congress to pass yet another $2 trillion spending plan, this time to revamp America's roads, bridges and other infrastructure. President Trump setting high sights on U.S. infrastructure and how to improve it. 
Taking to Twitter on Tuesday, Trump called for lawmakers to take advantage of the near-zero interest rate environment. He encouraged them to adopt a very big and bold package focused solely on jobs and rebuilding the once great infrastructure of our country. He added that the funds should be included in the next virus aid bill, which lawmakers are currently drafting to respond to the crisis. They refer to it as phase four. The president's comments revive his 2016 campaign pledge to fix the country in places where infrastructure is crumbling. But it seems that not all of Washington is on board. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell voiced caution about moving forward with a fourth stimulus package. In an interview on The Hugh Hewitt Show, he said the U.S. should wait a few days or weeks and see how things are working out. He added that he won't allow the bill to give Democrats an opportunity to pass unrelated policy items. Trump's call to fortify infrastructure spending follows the massive $2.2 trillion virus relief bill Congress passed last week, which he signed soon after. That stimulus bill includes checks to households, as well as loans and grants to small businesses. At the same press conference, Pompeo touted America's goodwill towards the rest of the world. It seems to be in response to China's recent propaganda efforts during the outbreak. In an uncommon occurrence, Mike Pompeo described the aid and goodwill the U.S. gives international organizations and countries around the world. We don't talk about assistance much, but the American people should be aware of and proud of our vast commitments to these important institutions. The move may be a response to the Chinese Communist Party, which is portraying itself as a global savior during the pandemic. It has been using large sales of medical supplies for PR points, even disguising some sales as donations. Pompeo says the U.S. contributed more than $400 million to the World Health Organization last year, 10 times China's contribution. To protect those most at risk from the virus, the U.S. sent nearly $1.7 billion to the U.N. Refugee Agency. This compares to $1.9 million from China. Pompeo added that it's not just the American government helping. American businesses and private charities have given $1.5 billion to fight the pandemic. And after Trump signed a record-breaking $2 trillion aid bill, the Pentagon's acting inspector general will ensure it's being properly implemented. Glenn Fine is the Pentagon's top watchdog. He'll chair the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. The committee is tasked with preventing fraud, waste, abuse and mismanagement of the $2 trillion in aid. It's one of three key oversight mechanisms for the aid package. The others are a special inspector general appointed by President Trump and a congressional oversight commission appointed by congressional leaders. Several American companies are looking to produce tens of thousands of ventilators. Ford says it will make 50,000 by June. The governor of New York said the state needs 30,000 ventilators. To meet that demand and others like it, Ford is looking to make 50,000 ventilators by July. In cooperation with General Electric, Ford said it'll make ventilators with a simplified design approved by the FDA. Besides the medical equipment on the way, the FDA has also authorized a two-minute test kit for COVID-19. It's a blood test, and the company producing it says it'll have millions out to healthcare workers within the next few weeks. So far, Johns Hopkins reports that over 181,000 people have tested positive in the U.S. That includes several high-profile cases, like the Google vice president, President Vinton Cerf. He's considered one of the founding fathers of the internet and announced that he tested positive on Twitter Monday. Cerf said he's recovering. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. And now to New York, America's CCP virus hotspot. Another makeshift hospital is being set up in Queens today. And Governor Andrew Cuomo emphasizing the need for hospitals to cooperate, setting up a coordination team to avoid more overwhelmed hospitals. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said on Tuesday they met with the entire state health care system for the first time Monday. Officials are working to unify hospitals across the state. How to move people among hospitals so nobody gets overloaded, shifting patients, shifting staff, shifting supplies. They set up a central coordination team led by the Department of Health to organize patient transfers. It's one coordinated system. It's much easier said than done, but we have to do it. On top of that, you have to overlay the new federal beds that came in. 
And now there is one more hospital to add to the list. In Queens, the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center expected to provide beds. It's this particular bank of court is six courts and it'll be the first phase of construction for what will ultimately be 350 hospital beds in the indoor training center. But like the U.S. Comfort Ship, the stadium is set to treat patients who don't have the virus, since other hospitals are swamped with virus patients. Cuomo is still urging healthcare workers across the nation to come to New York, some airlines taking it as an opportunity to help out. Delta and JetBlue are now offering free flights for health professionals traveling to certain areas to lend a hand. Melina Weiskup, NTD News, New York. To speed up testing, the New York State Department of Health is developing new types of tests looking at saliva, antibodies and plasma. And just today, Governor Cuomo's brother and CNN anchor Chris Cuomo tested positive for the CCP virus. The news anchor says he is quarantined in his basement and will do his shows from there. And as New York City struggles to keep up with the spread of the virus, dozens of healthcare workers from Atlanta boarded a plane to answer the call for help. Heroes are flying into New York to help with the crisis. Southwest Airlines says 29 healthcare professionals from Atlanta boarded one of its flights to LaGuardia Airport. According to the airline, the health workers wanted to do their part to help those in need. New York hospitals are dealing with thousands of confirmed cases and more than a thousand deaths. The flight crew joined the health workers and other passengers in this photo as they held up their hands to make heart shapes. And another kind of help is on the way. A portion of the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center is said to transform into a 350-bed temporary hospital. New York City agencies are converting the U.S. Open's venue to help the city cope with the pandemic. One of the center's indoor tennis facilities will be converted on Tuesday. A U.S. Tennis Association spokesman says they are here to help. And according to New York City Emergency Management, the facility will likely hold non-virus cases, but it will be decided based on need. Amazon has fired an employee at a New York warehouse after he helped organize a protest. The company says he put employees at risk by attending the walkout. More than a dozen workers at the Staten Island facility walked off the job on Monday. Their goal? To bring attention to the way managers are handling the virus pandemic. Christian Smalls was a process assistant there. He spent part of the weekend appearing in the media, saying he wants Amazon to temporarily close the warehouse after an employee there tested positive. He added that he wants the company to disinfect the facility. Amazon later fired him on Monday after he appeared at the protest. He says that's because he brought attention to the situation. Amazon claims he was fired because he was on a 14-day paid leave after he had contact with the employee who tested positive. U.S. citizens stranded in Nepal due to the country's lockdown are being evacuated. And in Ecuador, some families are having to keep the bodies of their loved ones at home for days, while authorities try to improve their collection service. A chartered plane evacuated 302 American nationals, including nine children from Nepal on Tuesday amid the virus pandemic. Tourists had become stranded in Nepal after the government extended its lockdown until April 7th. The U.S. government arranged the evacuation for those American citizens who want to go home at this moment of crisis. Families of deceased people bid their last farewell at a Madrid cemetery on Tuesday. Overnight, Spain registered 849 fatalities related to the virus, the nation's highest number in 24 hours since the epidemic started. A doctor who was in close contact with Russian leader Vladimir Putin says he has himself been diagnosed with the virus. The Kremlin said that Putin was being regularly tested for the virus and that everything is okay. Health workers in India sprayed disinfectant on a group of migrant workers during the nationwide lockdown. One government official later said they had been ordered to disinfect buses, but in their zeal, they had also turned their hoses onto workers. And Ecuador struggles to collect the bodies of people who've passed away. Authorities said on Monday they would improve collection as in some cases, families are keeping their loved ones' bodies in their homes for days. As millions self-isolate across the world, many of us may be spending a lot of time by ourselves. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirral found out why you don't have to travel to journey inward. Empty streets across the world as millions are confined to their own homes. David Pearl, who helps global business leaders think outside the box, 
started these free street wisdom workshops several years ago, taking inspiration from the ordinary things on the street. He says it can also help you stay calm and grounded while spending a lot of time at home. So, you know, the street isn't the magic you are. Pearl says what's happening is a strange paradox. Um, you know, people do not want this to be happening. It is a, it is a disaster in many senses. It also forces a, re, a shake up of our thinking. His techniques to tune in include appreciating the things around you as well as slow right down, or we say slow right down. You may get weird looks from your family members, but he says a fun way to try it is to do domestic activities slowly. I sweep the floor slowly. Really enjoying every moment. My wife says this is the normal speed at which I do the sweeping, but I'm doing it consciously, enjoying every inch. And so slow right down is a way, mentally and physically, of really setting your own tempo. And for some, physical solitude can provide space for spiritual enlightenment. If you think about it, you know, monks and, uh, and other, you know, esoteric, practitioners often stay very still and it's a way of removing external distraction and and, and recognizing there's a universe within it's it sounds very sort of bumper stickery but a, a lot of people are discovering that he says while difficult times lie ahead it will deepen our understanding of ourselves and others jane Worrell, ntd news london Musicians who can't perform because of the CCP virus pandemic find a way to harmonize virtually. Let's listen to their amazing song. Tell that my music would be impossible. They couldn't get together and play music like usual, but it was no obstacle for John Miles and the Antwerp Philharmonic Orchestra. They put together a recording of the Miles hit track Music While Apart. So I recorded mine in this room right here um, last Sunday. Everyone else in the orchestra, I don't know how many there were, there must be over 70 people there, plus a choir, plus a room section. Uh, did all this, sent all this by email, and uh, it was all put together very nicely. These musicians normally play together for the Night of the Proms concert series. The CCP virus pandemic has put their performances on hold, so the organizers decided to try something different. Miles' song Music reached the top 10 when it was released in 1976, and it's been a featured song for Night of the Prom since the event started in 1985. A lot of people just say that this song is, is so very uplifting. Um, both lyrically and musically, and I think more musically because there's more music than there is lyric. Um, I, I still find it very uplifting when I play it myself now. So. Miles spoke of the importance of keeping busy as many people around the world cope with being in lockdown. He hopes a video like this provides some entertainment. Here at China In Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. And we just passed 100,000 subscribers. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.